are twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones are twenty-four elders, dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning, and rumblings, and peals of thunder, and in front of the throne burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne there, are, there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with a face like a human face, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and inside. Day and night without ceasing they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall below, before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. A vision. A vision of worship in heaven. A vision that builds on the stories of Scripture invites us to see the one on the throne who is beyond our sight, to experience power and majesty, to join with all creation in worship. I invite you to stand and join in our opening hymn. We often sing this around the Christmas time when we think of nativities and Jesus coming to this world. Hail to the Lord's anointed is number 203 in the United Methodist Church.
Good morning. Thanks for remaining standing and joining in our call to worship. All holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I read that. <laughs> I'm sorry. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold. We cannot fully understand the depth of God's love. But we know that God is with us in all times and places, calling us to follow the way of Jesus, guiding us by the work of the Holy Spirit. Our world is a broken and divided place. May God is making all things new. Come and let us worship the Lord. Let us be doers of the word and not merely hearers. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture this morning is Revelation chapter 5. Verses 1 through 14. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seal? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And now I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he could open the scroll in its seven seals. <laughs> then I saw before the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are, are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell before the Lamb, each holding a harp in golden bones full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of so many angels surrounding the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down
so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could, who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was with the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see the light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall be bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. May God bless the reading, hearing, and doing of the word. Amen.
be acceptable to you and bring glory to you. Alpha and Omega, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we study the scriptures. We encounter the strange and troubling visions of John of Patmos. We talked a bit last week about this being a letter to seven specific churches in what are now Eastern Turkey. Seven churches that are known to this John who has been exiled. Seven churches that John is calling to renew faithfulness. I talked a bit last week about John feeling hopeless, about being on the losing end of a series of arguments. I talked about how we need to root our understanding of Revelation in the whole of Scripture. And our scripture unfolds with the stories of God's people. From the stories of creation, the fall, through exodus and liberation. I think it's not accidental how often Revelation mirrors the plagues that God announces on Egypt. We'll talk about that a bit as the series goes forward. The division of the kingdom of Israel after David and Solomon, the north collapsing of the Assyrians, the south feeling a little full of themselves until the Babylonians come and do the same thing to them. And much of the Old Testament concerns itself with the time of exile. And then we jump as Christians into the New Testament the Gospels, the birth of Christ, the crucifixion, the resurrection. And we read the Old Testament as pointing to these things, and that is appropriate. But we should not let our reading make it seem that the Old Testament had nothing to say to the people at the time it was written. We root ourselves in its stories. We understand Christ revealed in its stories. But our reading doesn't necessarily supersede others. But this small faction of Jews experiences the resurrection, believes that God has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Paul, originally an opponent, becomes one of the foremost advocates and radically understands God's love and grace to include not just Jewish brothers and sisters, but Gentiles. And the church expands exponentially. And Paul's letters to the expanding church are collected and begin to be considered as scripture. And other letters are written, the gospels are written, particularly after a Jewish rebellion sparks Rome's destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. All of Judaism is thrown into chaos, trying to redefine who they are without their central rituals and the Christians have a ready answer. Destroy this temple in three days, I will build it again. Our focus of worship, John and others are proclaiming, is Christ. And it's hard for us to get our heads around living in Fort Scott in 2024 as members of the largest, largest faith in the world, one of the larger denominations, citizens, of empire. How small John's faction feels in the world. They're not convincing their Jewish brothers and sisters. They're certainly not transforming the Roman Empire. And if we read John of Patmos' letter, he feels like he's not even getting through to his closest friends. And he turns to a style of writing called apocalyptic. Apocalyptic means unveiled. It typically concerns itself with end times. It's the kind of literature you write and read when there is no hope, and yet you 
Hold to that hope that God will make a way. It flourished late in the first century in both Jewish and Christian circles. It flourished in the time before Christ, during and after the exile, and again during the Seleucid Empire, which we don't really read about in the Bible. But if you read the Apocrypha, the books that Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox hold, that Protestants don't, there's a long story behind that. It basically comes down to whether you're translating Hebrew text or Greek text. Because when they translated the Old Testament into Greek, they kept writing. And when the Reformation happened, Luther and others went, we're going to go back to the original Hebrew, so they left out the additional Greek parts. It's not a right or wrong answer there, it's just different understandings of the canon. But during that intertestamental period, there was a Jewish rebellion. For over a hundred years, they ruled themselves under a series of leaders known as the Maccabees. And during that time, there was a great urge to faithfulness, to renewed commitment to their understanding of what it was to be Jewish. And they wrote. And one of the surviving writings that we do hold to scripture in the United Methodist Church with other Protestants is Daniel 7 through 12, which is apocalyptic writing. Parts of Ezekiel that deal with end times, a messenger, God making a way when there seems to be no way. And those books are written during exile or situated in time of exile, written to encourage the then contemporary folks to great faithfulness. That's really what John of Patmos is doing as he writes Revelation. But he can't overtly criticize the Roman Empire, but he can criticize Babylon. He can't overtly call out the injustice and heresy that he sees, but he can cast it in mythic terms, drawing from his forefathers, from Daniel, from Ezekiel, from all of Scripture, to call his people in his time to a greater faithfulness. To answer the question, who do we believe Jesus is? How does God reveal himself? Why does it seem like injustice is winning when we know that God is good? John of Patmos proclaims Jesus the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We talked last week about timelines a bit. I had us read the beginning and the end of the, of the letter this series of visions, but I had us delve into chapter 12, because I want us to see that it's not a simple linear progression. We live in linear time, but the authors of great mystical writings, of apocalyptic writings, are working on multiple levels at the same time. Ripples in the water, concentric circles, different places of focus. I used the 1977 computing power film called Powers of Ten as an illustration. If we're focused on the nucleus of a cell, our field of vision is very different than if we are focused on galaxies or billions and billions of stars. And yet as we gather and worship, the one who was and is and is to come is active at all of those levels. It's not that God is limited, it's that our focus is limited. When we're focused on a cellular level, the world can end in ways that don't even affect the galaxies. A star can blink out, and it makes no day-to-day -day difference in our lives. And yet at that level of focus, it's the end of the world. And God holds all of this. Creation is beyond our understanding. God is transcendent. Yet with us, we are called to be caretakers of God's creation, to be co-participants with God, finite as we are, flawed as we are. So bearing that in mind, let us continue to delve deeply into this book. We read chapter 4, a vision of a door open in heaven. We'll finish the series with the letters that open the series. 
the letters to the seven churches, I think we'll have a deeper understanding of what John is encouraging them to do. But you may know if you read the book, I know it's a couple of your favorite passages from the book. The letter to Laodicea ends with a vision of Jesus standing at the door knocking. And if those who hear his voice open the door, he will eat with them. He will break bread with them. They will be together. It is an invitation. We turn the page to chapter 4 and there is a door open in heaven. John is invited in and he sees this great scene of worship. 24 elders, they're not specified, but it certainly evokes the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples, two sets of 12, a number of perfection and completion. Jews do not name God. We recognize as Christians that we cannot fully describe God. But John tries, the one seated on the throne, this vision of light and power, a storm, thunder and lightning, precious jewels, light refracting, a rainbow, throughout the Bible a symbol of promise, of renewal of God's self-restraint, shining like an emerald. Seven flames, spirits of God, an understanding of the Holy Spirit is dynamic, of having certain attributes. And four living creatures. And these are mysterious creatures indeed, eyes inside and out, taking everything in. Six wings, speed, movement, the ability to go anywhere. A lion, like, a fox, like an ox, like a flying eagle, one with a face like a human. Notice how often John is specific that he's using metaphor. He doesn't say this is that, he says like. He evokes imagination, he evokes stories, he evokes symbols. He invites us to see the symbols anew. One of the problems in our modern time of making sense of this book is that we do not know scripture like John and his original audience would have known scripture. The moment these descriptions began, the original audience would have thought of Ezekiel, who describes very similar creatures and worship of God in a similar, not identical, but similar vision of worship. We tend to literalize things. And if we can't make enough sense of it, we just ignore it. We become absolute. By the second century, these four living creatures have become symbols of the four Gospels. They're attributes used to describe the beginning or the message of each Gospel. And interestingly, over the first several centuries, the authors, the forefathers of the Church are not in agreement on which of the living creatures is which Gospel because their symbolism overlaps. They are integrated to one another. They draw from one another. They all point us to God who is beyond our understanding. We don't need to nail everything down. We need to stand in awe and wonder. We need to worship and proclaim with these creatures, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, God beyond our understanding and yet with us. And keep in mind the original audience didn't have chapter and verse. I'm glad we do because we can be sure we're talking about the same chapter and verse, but these stories unfolded. They flowed from one scene to another. Very often our chapter markers organized thought in a way that would have been foreign to the original author. In the midst of this flow of worship, John becomes aware that the one on the throne is holding a scroll, and that scroll is well sealed, seven seals in fact. And John becomes aware that no one is worthy to open this scroll. And John of Patmos weeps bitterly. Because it seems to him that God's will has been blocked. But the messenger says to him, 
Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. See, the lion of Judah, the messenger of God says, Behold, this too would have evoked all kinds of associations for John's first audience. In contemporary times, it's no accident that the great theologian and writer C.S. Lewis chooses a lion as the central character of his Narnia series, the Christ figure. Aswan, Lewis writes, is not a tame lion. It's one of the most troubling, fascinating, and true lines in all of Lewis's writing. This Aslan is with us, and yet we do not fully understand. Christ is with us. Christ sacrifices for us, and yet we try to contain and define instead of engage with and follow. And notice the difference between what John hears what John sees. He hears the angel say, look, behold, the Lion of Judah, and he looks and he sees a lamb. A lamb that has been sacrificed. A perfect offering. Again, the first century audience would have known this symbolism. This lamb has been sacrificed and yet lives. And this lamb has seven eyes, a number of completion and of all seeing, and seven horns, symbols of power. This lamb is difficult for us to visualize. All of these symbols are not meant to be taken literally, but to evoke stories of the culture of the Old Testament, to make proclamation of who this lamb is, the Lion of Judah, a symbol of light, of perseverance, of majesty, has offered himself knowingly, intentionally, as the perfect offering, not just for Judah, but for all of creation. The blood becomes the cup of forgiveness, mercy for the nations, for humanity that has gone astray. We proclaim the majesty of Jesus Christ and him crucified. We proclaim that he yet lives, that he bears the wounds that our sins inflict, and yet loves the world with a depth that we cannot fully comprehend. Brothers and sisters, let us worship. Let us be willing to cast our crowns before him, to recognize the limits of our understanding, to stand in awe of God and God's covenant and God's love, to see things differently through these visions, to proclaim you are worthy, receiving power and glory, for you created all things, you hold all things from the greatest galaxy to the smallest nucleus of a cell, you hold these things in the divine hand. You will us to exist. You are eternally patient. As we read scripture, there's a scene of worship for all the creatures in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea are worshiping God proclaiming worthy is the Lamb, every creature in heaven, every creature on earth, every creature under the earth, every creature in the sea, all of creation around us sees the Creator and worships. But we humans are a stiff-necked people. Creation worships to the one seated on the throne, to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And then, from the scene of worship, we turn back to the scene on earth in the midst of human civilization. 
And we get to the four horsemen. You probably know a lot about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And very little of what you know comes from scripture. John of Patmos writes of the opening of the seven seals. Then I saw the Lamb open one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures call out, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature call out, Come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth. So the people would slaughter one another, and he was given a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the living, third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and there was a black horse. Its rider held a pair of scales in his hands. I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's pay, and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come. I looked, and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, and pestilence, and by the wild animals of the earth. You read the commentaries through the ages. That first white horse conquest is heavily disputed. Based largely on an image in Revelation 19, some authors claim that this is Jesus himself come out to conquer. Others proclaim this white horse rider is the Antichrist. You can't get a whole lot farther in interpretation than that. Notice it does not even hint that either of those claims are accurate. It literally says... I looked, and there was a white horse, its rider had a bow, a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Now, if you are the oppressed, being conquered is bad. But if you are the faithful, well, you are more than conquerors, Scripture tells us. Those who conquer, those who persist, are blessed. We have to make an interpretation. We're not called to certainty here. We're called into sacred imagination to see, to interpret. And I firmly believe, and I might be wrong, but I firmly believe this is not John's vision of the immediate future of his time or of ours. I would argue these four horsemen are reality of human civilization. God doesn't need to unleash people who want to conquer, who carry swords and want war. God doesn't need to unleash famine, which is basically economic injustice. Death is already a part of our story. We inflict it on one another. This is reality of what humans with free will do to each other. It's not God's will or desire. But it is what is unfolding in our midst, in John's time, in our time. A day's pay for just enough wheat to maybe make a loaf of bread will not feed a family. But in John's time, in our time, the frivolities of the rich are often unaffected. That which is necessary for the poor to survive escalates in cost. That is merely a trivial plaything. It doesn't. It's not God's will or vision for the future, but it is what we do to one another here and now in John's time and our own. 
So John's vision continues. A fifth seal is opened, and John becomes aware that under the altar in his great vision of heavenly worship, which is still ongoing, he can see the living souls of the martyrs, those who have died from injustice, those who have been killed for their faith. And they are crying out to God, how long? Until vengeance. How long until you will make this right? And God counsels to those living souls patience. Their number is not complete. Injustice is pervasive, but it will not win. But God's time is not our time. Not even those of us who are involved in the heavenly worship understand all that God is doing. And the sixth seal is opened. And the sky rolls up like a scroll. The sun is blotted out. The stars fall to earth. It's a scene of nothingness. The kings and the rulers and the rich, the unbelievers hide under the mountains. Who can stand against the anger of God, they ask. They ask the mountains to fall in on them, to end them before God's wrath does. And still, the visions go on. John's frame of reference changes again as all of this unfolds. He becomes aware of a growing number of worshipers. 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Jews, proclaiming God's majesty and glory. They are sealed, they are anointed. I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count. In every nation, tribe, people, and language. Notice again, what he hears is the meticulous counting of 144,000. There are denominations here today in our world that believe 144,000 people will be saved. The denomination most responsible for proclaiming that literal belief has more than 144,000 letters. I'm not sure how they'll decide. They claim to be taking scripture literally, but they miss what scripture is saying. Or we have people alive today who only consider Israel's value as a predictor of their understanding of the end times. Certain things have to happen before God wipes them all out and elevates our particular tribe to glory. And they claim to be taking scripture literally, but they don't hear what scripture is saying. They take away, they add to 144,000 and 12 times 12 a symbolic number, perhaps, a fullness of God's love and mercy for the Jewish people that is not limited to the Jewish people but contains multitudes from every nation, tribe, people, and language. God's mercy, God's grace, God's love extends beyond our tribe, beyond our boundary, beyond our understanding. God hears. John hears a number, a limit. John sees more than he can count, more than anyone can count. John is told to see a lion. He hears, see the lion of Judah, but he sees Christ, the suffering one, the sacrificial lamb, pouring out himself to tell us who God is and who we are. The seventh seal is open at the beginning of chapter 8. As we're reading through these visions, we're ready for something grand to happen. And they 
is silence in heaven for half an hour. And we'll get Nancy in 15 seconds. Early in my journey into ministry, I helped plan a worship service with the pastor at university. We spent weeks introducing the concept of silent reflection to the congregation, building it up from a few seconds to a couple of minutes. We got to where we could do three or four minutes with proper introduction. The congregation was getting it. Finally, we got to the Sunday when we were going to go five minutes, and about 30 seconds into it, fortunately, at university, there were a pulpit and a lectern, and we sat in such a way that the congregation couldn't see us, because Gail and I were looking at each other going, are you supposed to be talking about <laughs> Oh, yeah, this is the thing we've been setting up for weeks, but we were so busy trying to do all the things that we missed the point of our own worship plan. The seventh seal is opened and there is silence. Seven trumpets are handed out to the angels and a new round of visions begins. And over the coming weeks, we'll start unpacking those but as we unpack those visions and those horrors and those challenges, I want us to remember that God is with us beyond our understanding, deep within our DNA. God is with us. The battle has already been won. And yet we are called to worship. We are called to recognize that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Surely he has borne our infirmities, carried our diseases. The Alpha and the Omega understands what it is to be human. And we, every one of us, have fallen short. God has taken on our shortcomings and redeemed us and waits patiently for us to join the song of creation. Holy, holy, holy. God of power and might. Let it be so in our lifetimes. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of response is Let Us Plead for Faith Alone. It's number 385 in the United Methodist Hymn. <laughs>
asking for any of the groups that meet here at the church to give us a uh, blurb for the September bulletin uh, that is coming up uh, later this week. We'd like to have those together so we can start laying everything out. And if you are connected to a group in town that is doing an activity in September, October, November that you want people to know about, give us a newsletter article. Let's make this something that we can read to connect to ourselves, to connect to the community. So I encourage you to be thinking about that and inviting folks uh, aging forward or lifelong learning and fellowship group for retired adults and anyone interested is meeting on Friday. On uh, Saturday, we have the uh, celebration of the new Southeast Kansas district. The Tuckers and I are going. We'd love to have a couple more folks join us for that to uh, meet with our fellow United Methodists in Southeast Kansas. And we've got several announcements from the basket today. Uh, Peggy Stark is celebrating a new grandbaby. Uh, Nolan and his wife Lee have a baby girl, Hazel Lee, who was born yesterday in Sacramento, so we know where Peggy will be heading soon. Uh, Debbie Ford is asking for prayer. She's having surgery on Friday, so let's hold Debbie in our prayers. Um, I won't share a lot of details, but I especially want to highlight uh, Charlotte and Larry Swain. They are continuing to face a number of challenges, and so let's be holding them in prayer. I know they would appreciate cards and calls. Uh, Bonnie Milburn is asking for prayers for her grandson, who is having heart surgery soon. Uh, his name is Joe. And um, it has come to our attention that there's a team called the Kansas City Chiefs, I think it is. And uh, they play uh, the kind of football I don't watch as much as soccer, but uh, it's very entertaining, I'm told. And uh, they have a 3 o'clock game on uh, the uh, day of the fish fry, September 15th. So we're going to move, kick off of the fish fry back a little bit to 7. So feel free to watch uh, Mahomes and Kelsey and all those folks and then come join us at the fish fry on September 15th, and I uh, believe that is the announcement, so let us continue in prayer. Gracious and holy God, we thank you. We thank you for your son Jesus, for his humility, for his service, for the way he takes on our brokenness and shows us your will, not in suffering and death, but in resurrection and new life in the flowers of the field, and the birds of the air, we are called to worship, to recognize your glory and majesty, to understand that you will us to be, that you hold all of creation, our neighbors, our opponents and enemies, you cause the rain to fall on the good and the evil. You call us to repent, ways of empire and control and domination, to enter into lives of service, to recognize the diversity of your creation and see as you first did good, to yield control and accept our interconnectedness with you and with each other. This day, we pray that we would take another step in faith, a deeper understanding of your creation, of your grace, of your love. We pray that we would live out the words that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. I invite the ushers to come forward and collect this day's part of our tithes and offerings.
the prayer of dedication. Eternal God, your wisdom is greater than our minds and your truth and life Thanks be to God. Amen. Yeah.